This is CFF All Access, the college fantasy football cast, football podcast at Fantasy Points. Hello, I'm Eric Froton. This is the CFF All Access Fantasy Podcast. Along with me, my co-host, Josh Chevalier of Fantasy Points and Zach Hall, the statistician, the czar of the spreadsheet. And we're going to kick right into it because we've got a big show. We've got 10 QBs to talk about. And if you know anything about this show, you know that I like to be verbose, as they like to say. So uh, the top 10 in this particular order, number 10, Avery Johnson, Kansas State, will be given by Josh. Shador Sanders is number nine. Haynes King, Georgia Tech, is number eight. Garrett Green, West Virginia, seven. Number six, a true favorite of all college fantasy football aficionados, Nico Yami. Yeah. Iyama Liava. I am I am a Liava. Iyama Liava. Iyama Liava. Nico Iyama Liava. Close. Tennessee. Jackson Dart, number five. Jordan McLeod, number four. Dylan Gabriel, number three. Byron Brown, number two. And Caden Salter, number one. Josh, if you could for us, who were some of the toughest omissions from this top ten list based on what we've seen out there by ADP? Well, I mean, I think we just got to get with it right away and say this is a six-point passing touchdown list. You're right. How could I forget? How could I forget? So that's, that customer. may change the game a little bit on who got omitted here. It but, does. you know, there's a few guys, right? Like Seth Hennigan, right, in a six-point passing touchdown league format. Like that's a guy that was really close, I think, for all of us, right? We have Jackson Arnold. Uh, you know, some homerism here might have had Cam Ward. Uh, making it very close to getting on this list, uh, but couldn't quite couldn't quite push through. But those are a few of the, the guys, right, that I think all of us um, had at least sniffing the top 10. Uh, Chandler Morris is another one uh, that all of us mm-hmm. were, you know, decently high on. Uh, but they all, Katz, all missed. Especially Andrew Katz, shout out to the BTR <laughs> podcast, talking about, Chandler Morris, I swear to God, he has been the Chandler Morris stan of stands for the past three years. Like, I swear, his family didn't believe in him, and Katz did. <laughs> uh, yes. it, for me, uh, a couple a couple of interesting omissions here, at least going by, as we always reference, the CFF Champions League. Jalen Milrow was taken in the second one of our leagues. We, we just did the third, but I got the second board up right now. He was taken at the, the sixth pick in the fifth round, the 5-6. Uh, and I want to say he was like QB five there. Heath took him, I believe QB four, uh, right before Haynes King. So him being off, I think it is a, you know, speaks to the six point passing touchdown, uh, constraints. No, it shouldn't be constraints. It should just be universal here. But, uh, when in that particular league, somehow we let Greg keep doing the four point passing touchdowns and you see it Kyron drones as well. Uh, I want to say he was the QB eight here, which, you know, it was taken by Greg, Debbie Warehouse, but that's been a big Chris K. Uh, I know that he's been, in fact, out, outspoken on Twitter. He had mentioned Kyron drones and called me out about it. I will call out Mrs. K who is actually going to be listening to this on the 10 hour drive they have tomorrow. Hi, Mrs. K. Thank you for humbling us on the drive. And, um, you know, in terms of drones, I think he's possibly the best example, him and Milrow, but he takes a real hit in the six-point passing touchdown type formats because, let's face it, this is a defense coach, defensive coach, pretty conservative in terms of their play calling. Um, is there anybody else that you think was kind of close? Hennigan definitely had a, had a case. Yeah, what do you got, Zach Hall? You got anybody, Zach? Um, Hennigan was one for me for sure. Jackson Arnold was was close up there. Dude, Jackson um, Arnold didn't make it. Where did you guys have no. him ranked? Where do you have him, Josh? Really Josh know things smiling. like that. Where do you have him, Josh? Josh had him. I think it was all Josh again. Yeah, where? where Fourteen. Where, Josh? Look, man, somebody's got to bring a oh, sense great. of rationality. 
to this Great. podcast. No, you guys no keep trying to put guys in these lists that don't this deserve it. Like Ishmael Mahdi. Ridiculous. Where, okay. Zach, where did you have Jackson Arnold? I think I had him right around 14 as well. You had him around 14? Oh, so you're blaming on Josh. So it's both of you. He he had him at 11. He had this him at 11. He was, he was better than you're, you're, 11. I, knew, okay. I knew I could trust you at least a little bit. Zach, who did you have? Give me your give me your eight, nine, ten now, Josh. Give me your eight, nine, ten. Oh. They're better than than is, Jackson Arnold. It's really his ten. Nine, it's his ten. ten. Oh, great! Give yes. it to me. Yeah, let's hear it. No, no, you wanted this. You getting it? My my ten is Chandler Morris. Your ten, ten is Chandler Morris. Oh, I thought it was well, you I, and Cats. I thought I you had Cam Ward in the top ten. Yes. Oh, you, did seven. you have Cam Ward over Jackson Arnold, dude? Hey, look. Look, I don't hey, think look, I'm looking all hey, that look. bad right now. After he went 19 for 24 for 325 yards and three touchdowns in the spring Delightful. game. You're going to spring game. This is Jackson Arnold. Bro, okay. All right, whatever you want. Do you want to go to the bowl game? He looked good for a half of a bowl game, bro. He looked he good for a half. He was terrible in that first half. Bowl game, okay? He was terrible when, in the first when half. When can we say Let's Chandler Morris has is. been magical? <laughs> has, 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 has Cam Ward been magical? Look, give me, a, Jackson give me Arnold even a lighter looked, adjective. Look, Jackson Arnold looked magical for about half of a oh. game last year. The other games he played, he did not look so good. He looked like a true freshman. So true. I'm just saying. Freshman. Okay. Sorry, so you're I'm just saying. There we go. Yes. I, I just think All I right. just think Cam Ward is gonna have a better year. We'll see. Look, we're, we have receipts right now. Uh I'm disappointed. Uh, I'm gonna have to put this out there to the masses for a uh, a vote, be it on Twitter, be it on this particular platform, however it is. Shane will not be allowed to vote. Uh, Klubnik, <laughs> Klubnik, come on, Shane. I know you watched the Clemson spring game. I watched it. Every Anybody who, who was subjected to that eye torture, which was basically the – I mean, the offense was between him and Vizina. I, I would go with Clockwork Orange when – uh, you know, Malcolm McDowell's character goes back in the pouring rain to the one that he created the ultra violence on and they, they tape him and they make his eyes stay open and he has to watch all the ultra violence. That's a, to Beethoven. That's what I feel like that Clemson spring game was. So um, he will never be anywhere near a top 10 for QBs. That being said, Jack, Jackson Arnold should have. And I'm frankly disappointed in both of you. <laughs> well, We'll we'll try to make you more proud next time. How about yeah, that? Yeah, then leave Cam Ward out top ten. <laughs> Bro, top we'll ten. I mean, I know there's a lot of projection involved here with the North Texas offense here with Chandler Morris, but come on, man, really? I don't know. All right, hey, maybe 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 the listeners feel different. Maybe Twitter will feel different, uh, but that's how it is. So that is uh, that is for better or worse. That is our top ten. And I believe we'll have a break coming very shortly. Oh. All right. We are going to get in here now to our actual top 10 CFF quarterbacks for the 2024 season. So Eric did a great job of going down the list. He even got Nico Ayamaleva's name right. Let's try to say that. Barely. I don't five. know, man. I, it took me seven <laughs> tries. Hey, that's okay. That's okay. You got it right at least once. So, and here we are. We're going to start. So this whole time we've been going through our running backs, our wide receivers, and then we're now at QBs. And we've been doing three things, looking at their player profile, looking at the historical play caller data, and then looking at the team situation and then coming in with a discussion question as well. So um, we are going to get into it right away. We got Caden Salter, number one. And Caden Salter is a QB that is six foot, 200 pounds. And he scored, he was unbelievable last year, right? He scored 31 fantasy points per game. He had 2,800 yards passing, 32 touchdowns, which is absolutely insane. We'll get into that later. And he had 1,100 yards rushing. So he's Konami code quarterback, dual threat. He had 12 TDs there, and he played in the conference in Conference USA, which means that schedule was soft as butter. So it was he he had a crazy season. It was great. His play caller is Jamie Chadwell. You guys probably know Jamie Chadwell from his time at Coastal Carolina, where he ran a mixture of the triple option and the spread RPO. Uh, his QB one over the last four years 
which was Caden Salter last year, and he had Grayson McCall before that, averaged 28.7 fantasy points per game. So he, Jamie Chadwell, has produced amazing QBs over his time in the FBS. Team situation, they're pretty much bringing everybody back except C.J. Daniels, which is a big loss, right? You can't understate that. But we think that Caden Salter is probably good enough to overcome that. We have projected at 2,500 yards passing, 27 TDs, and then 900 yards uh, rushing, and then 10 TDs there for 35.8 fantasy points per game uh, and six-point passing touchdown leagues. So since we're talking six-point passing touchdown leagues, again, Caden Salter last year threw 32 TDs on 2,800 yards passing, which doesn't sound crazy, but I want to throw out a stat to you guys. Over the last 10 years, Jamie Chadwell has not had a QB throw for over 27 touchdowns other than Salter. So he's five touchdowns more than any other QB. So my question for you guys, are you guys worried at all about TD regression passing for Salter in 2024? Um, not particularly given the difference in competition. I mean, at least when he was, when we're talking about Chadwell at Coastal Carolina, he was taking over for Joe Moglia. Everything was kind of in place, you know, with that, that system, he took it over and just, you know, kept it sort of running. They were in the Sun Belt, though, which was they were on par talent wise with, you know, sometimes a little better, sometimes, you know, a little down. But they're always uh, it's a, a much more competitive conference than the Mac is now. It used to be kind of on par. And that is certainly not the case anymore. Um, but with Liberty, I'm not particularly worried about them, given them being much better than every other team around them. They're just blowing the doors off of teams. So if that's the case, then I, I don't see any reason why, you know, that gravy train would stop rolling given the talent differential and the fact they're going to put up another, you know, high 30s, 40 points a game. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think the one that I would maybe be a little more concerned about is are they going to run him nearly as much? Is he going to have the 12 rushing touchdowns? I don't think that's, um, you know, I, I think he can definitely do that again. I, I That would just be the one where maybe there's a little bit of regression this year. But looking at – I think you touched on it perfectly, the schedule. I mean, it's – that he, they're, he's going to do whatever he wants against that schedule. And I think even looking at SP+, Plus, it's a little bit easier this year than it was last year. So um, I, I just feel like he's just going to have some big games and um, feel pretty confident about um, him hitting, hit, getting close to those numbers again. Yeah, I mean, I agree with y'all. It's it's fun to have some, <laughs> you know, try try to create some kind of controversy around Caden Salter. But while he's playing the Conference USA and not transfer, you know, transferring out to Auburn and the SEC like he flirted with in the offseason, you know, I think he's pretty safe to be the top QB, right? So uh, while I try to create some kind of good conversation, looks like there's a no chance of that. So Eric Froton, why don't you take us to our second QB? Sure, and uh, and I will give a shout out to our boy Quentin Fenske in the comments. It's almost almost the best time of year, CFF draft season. Bless your heart, Quentin. You are correct. It is almost that time of year. That being said, it's Byram Brown time. Six three two zero nine. Major transfer portal rumors going on about Byron Brown floating right now. First off, we have to get it out of there. So. The fact that he's the number two QB here, uh, I don't have any shares of him in my best balls. I'm probably not going to, especially in a day. We're going to know if everybody's hitting the transfer portal. If he does, I mean, goodbye value, because this is the Alex Golish offense, former offensive coordinator for Josh Heupel at Tennessee. Just brought that right over and turned around a fairly more abundant USF franchise that uh, that was left in the doldrums by Jeff Scott, former Clemson offensive coordinator, much like everything that's happened at Clemson over the past couple of years. USF fell apart. In comes Golish and just turns it right around. 34 and a half points per game. Not, uh, not bad. I mean, we, I don't know what, what more we want from a team perspective there. Uh, 269 passing yards per game. Not bad. You know, you're at that 270 mark, 27 passing touchdowns, and 3,494 yards. Uh, I like it. You know, in terms of that, that's what we want to see in terms of the 
passing volume, third in pace of play as well for USF. So they have that same sort of chuck and duck mentality uh, where they like to stretch the field vertically. 44% of the targets went to the outside receiver. That is 22nd in the country last year. So uh, that's why we're seeing guys like, well, Sean Atkins is a slot. So that gives me a little bit of pause. We did go over Sean Atkins in our wide receiver, uh, you know, situation. He's a slot receiver, you know. And when I went and did my Byron Brown uh, brush up here and sort of did some film analysis, gosh, I mean, a Atkins is dependable. But looking at inside the numbers, I I'm a little inclined to be taking some flyers on their outside receivers now because that's where the targets go. Anyways, uh, on the team level, passing explosiveness, 30th. In the country, they are taking big shots downfield. But efficiency-wise, only 46% of USF's passes went for first downs. That is 119th in the country and kind of speaks to the boomer bust nature of this offense, which, you know, luckily playing the AAC, there's a lot of, a lot of booming. Uh, as far as Byron Brown goes, completed 26, 276 of 427 passes. 3,292 yards, only 7.7 .7 yards per attempt, middling. You want, you'd like to see that over eight, obviously, you know, as close to nine as you can get. Uh, 26 to 11 touchdown interception ratio. There were miscues. He's not a gifted, polished passer. I mean, you want him for his legs, you know, 203 rushes for 809 yards, 63 rushing yards per game, 11 touchdowns. We'll note he had five fumbles that he lost it's on the high end of. QBs, if you play in leagues that have three, usually you get a minus two for uh, turnovers. Some leagues have minus three. I kind of like that. It should sting a little bit. If, if you're in one of those leagues, that's a minus 33 with those 11. And then you throw on the five uh, fumbles. That's 16 turnovers. Not something to be just sort of hand waved, you know. Um, that being said, uh, the 11 touchdowns and the 800 yards, that's what we're here for. From a fantasy perspective, points, three games of 100-plus rushing yards. He had rushing TDs in eight of 14 games. In three of them, he had two-plus. He had four 300-yard passing games. He had six of 14 games for 250-plus passing yards. Seven games with two-plus passing TDs. Seven games. With 35 plus points out of 14, that's half. Pretty good from 35. I mean, 35 is a big number. 11 games with 20 plus points. So there's a really high floor for Brown all season with the potential and, you know, a likelihood of putting up seven games with 35 points. So that's half the time you're getting an explosive game. Uh, as far as his passing acumen, deep passing, 10th of 52 qualified passers with a 20% deep ball ratio. Pretty good. Again, this is Alex Golish. He wants to stretch the field on vertically on the outside. 20%, uh, one of every five passes is going deep. 37% of his throws went for 10 plus yards. Okay, so that's a pretty light intermediate volume. It's basically he's throwing those, those short uh, manufactured sort of touches or quick hitches. Or it's going deep. There's not a lot of reading the particular defense and hitting those, you know, hole shots. Uh, in terms of his deep grades, 63% deep grade, okay? That's the second worst in the FBS among qualifying quarterbacks with 50-plus attempts that are deep or more. I don't need to, I need to tell you how bad that is. We're not talking about a skilled passer here with Byron Brown, okay? That, that clearly illustrates it. The second worst in the FBS. Do you know who the worst – guys, do you know who the worst downfield passer by passing grade was in the FBS? I'm going to leave this uh, on what's this one up to Zach. I have no idea. <laughs> and it's probably significant. No clue. Okay, so like I said, second is Byron Brown, 63rd percentile. Worst. E.J. Warner, 52nd percentile, 11% worse wow. than Byron Brown. That's pretty, that's pretty bad. Pretty bad. So anyways, uh, of those, even though we went deep 20% of the time, he only completed 32% of those deep passes. 
uh, which is how you get to the second worst deep grade. You know, uh, that being said, all other three levels, not particularly inspiring, not bad. You had between a 72 or a 79 PFF passing grade to all those levels. Handling pressure, no pressure, 81 percentile offensive grade, 69% completion rate. Okay. 2,500 yards, 21 to 6 ratio. All this is fine. 16 to 9 big time throw to turnover worthy play rate. Uh, you don't like to see that with no pressure. And that's kind of a harbinger of things to come because when he was pressured, 40th percentile offensive grade, you know, overall, terrible, terrible. 51% completion rate, not not bad. I mean, that's kind of what you expect. You'd like to see it more, obviously. 768 yards, but a 5 to 5 ratio, not good. But then you get to the big time throw rate, only four big time throws to 14 turnover worthy plays when pressured. He is pretty much reliant on the system and the scheme. If he transfers somewhere else, I want no part of him. I mean, no part of him. He is Alex Golish's quarterback. Getting that, so we'll, we'll tie it up on the pressure front. 23% pressure, pressure to sack rate last year. 45 sacks taken. That's the third most in the country. 25% career pressure to sack rate. That's bad, obviously. Uh, 2.94 Time to throw, 2.94 seconds. That's the 19th longest out of, out of 95 QBs. He takes long to process. Uh, play action, pretty good. 64% uh, completion rate. Nine yards per attempt, 16 to 2 ratio, fine. No play action, 66%. Not bad, again. 10 to 9 touchdown interception rate. 7 to 17 big time throw to turnover worthy play rate. He's just, he needs the crutches. He needs Golish's schemes. He needs play action and he needs his legs. So overall, you know, this is what we're dealing with here with, uh, with Byron Brown. He's a scheme quarterback that if he, if he even, if he hints at the portal, all of those shares are immediately going to crater that you took the best balls draft with caution Especially in these next few days, I want to wait at least a week before I'm investing anything within a, a first three round pick on him. He's been going in the first round pretty much everywhere. Portal news is death of Byron Brown. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think definitely should not hit the portal. I mean, this is the year, right? They're returning what, like 18 to 20 starters on that team. I mean, they got a real shot to win the AAC this year. And so he really needs to stay another year um, and then hit. I think he should hit the portal in you know 2025 and make some money because, um, look, I mean, part of like you're talking about targeting outside wide receivers. They didn't have any good outside wide receivers last year. It's part of the problem. I mean, his outside wide receivers were comparable to uh, to Clemson's outside wide receivers the last couple of years. I think that's that explains some of, you know, his troubles throwing the ball. I mean, not everything, but yeah, just watching those games, watching them against UTSA. I mean, Sean Atkins is the only guy getting open, which is why he and he started to rely on him like a ton because he's the only guy that he can rely on to get open. So hopefully they, they can dip in the portal and get him some good help on the outside that they, they got a, I think, Purdue transfer in um, that could be decent, but they haven't hit very well on their transfer additions the last couple of years. So, but hopefully somebody can be attracted in that system because it'd be great to see uh, Byron Brown with some help on the outside. It would hurt Sean Atkins for sure, but. Um, yeah, I mean, Naheem oh. Simmons, he, he had some drops, I believe. With yeah. Some of the issues. Yeah. And he had like he's that one fast. game, right? He's fast, well, yeah. man. You know, I mean, I, he's dynamic. And if he's the one yeah. who's going to take over, it's a position that has to be respected that lead outside threat. Yeah. And yeah, at the end of the 2022 season, like I think the kid, uh, Byron Brown threw for like 750 yards between the UCF game and the Tulane game. Now Tulane's an awful defense, but he, I think he can, he's better than the stats suggest just because again, they had very little help, but that's fair. We shall see. please stay there. Let's not, yeah. like you said, he's done. If he, if he gets I cooked. Yeah, I need I need him to stay because I have drafted him a lot this year so far. So um, if he if he moves on, I could be in some trouble in some of these best balls. 
But yeah. I mean, you know, in four point passing touchdown leagues, he has the extra value too. So keep that in mind in those horrible leagues. Yeah. There you that go. being said, I took long go. enough on him. I said next. Hey, it's all good. <laughs> hey. Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a quick break, but yep. you guys stay with us because you're not gonna want to miss the rest of our top 10 QBs. All right, we're coming back, and Zach Hall is up with Dylan Gabriel at number three. Yeah, Dylan Gabriel. So transfer into Oregon um, this past year. Last year at Oklahoma, he threw for over 3,600 yards, 30 touchdowns, six interceptions. Uh, also ran for 373 yards and 12 touchdowns. Really good season from him last year. Um, this is another guy that uh, – transferred a couple times right we saw him at, at UCF as well where he um, put up some similar numbers two seasons there he threw for over 3,500 yards um, hit 29 touchdowns and 32 touchdowns his first two seasons there um, best rushing production came last year at Oklahoma but we have seen that from him the last few years which uh, really leads into um, Will Stein the the play caller at Oregon where we don't have a ton we talked a little bit about him last last week um we don't have a ton of history on him but we have seen what he did last year um at Oregon with Bo Nix right where Bo Nix was averaging 33 points um a game um ran the ball had had 234 rushing yards six touchdowns there and then Frank Harris in 2022 we saw how he used him as well which both of those guys top five QBs when they uh by the end of the season so a uh, really valuable spot that we get with Will Stein at the, at the quarterback position. Um, the, the, the quarterbacks are getting over 40 touchdowns a season with him rushing and passing combined. So that's huge. When you're looking at this, there's not many play callers that are going to give you that. Um, and you're just going to, they average 472 pass attempts a season as well. So they're going to, they're going to throw the ball. They're going to use them in the run game. Dylan Gabriel, um, really fits I think what they want to do what what he wants to do um last year uh Gabriel was one of the more consistent high-end QBs well he he finished uh five times in the top 10 um, week. um and he only fell outside I think he was a couple weeks in there where he was outside of like the top 40 but for the most part he he lived within that top 40 so every week he was he was pretty consistent with at least putting points up. Um, averaged thirty points a game. Uh, he had eight touchdowns with at least three or eight games with at least three touchdowns passing rushing combined, which fits with what Will Stein wants to do, right? His his quarterback's going to score the ball. So um, Gabriel really really fits that. Um, he's got weapons around him. We spent some time last week on. Evan Stewart, Tez Johnson. So he's, he has those receivers. They have Jordan James at, at running back um, three O-line starters coming back. That, that offense is just going to move. We know that um, they have weapons. Uh, the only concern I, I think that I have with, with this offense as a whole um, moving to the big 10 and seeing some better defenses. And I think that could <coughs> down just a little bit. Um, I think <laughs> a bit of regression on the touchdowns as a whole from this team. I think that the scoring could go down just a little bit, um, not necessarily every game, but just o over the, the season. I think uh, we'll see that regress just a little bit as well, which could hurt the value. But he's just a guy that he's been so consistent. He's he's um, put up points everywhere he's been. We've seen him transfer and still um, really be valuable in that next spot. So <laughs> Uh, he's a guy, I think we all had him at number three. Um, we have him projected to do 3,300 yards and over 12 games, 30 touchdowns, um, seven rushing touchdowns. So he's actually missing that uh, 40, 40 point or 40 touchdown season that um, we usually see with Will Stein. But a big piece of that, again, is going to come from just the, the schedule and it being a little bit tougher there. Um, he's a guy that he's he's kind of started to drop, it seems like, a little bit in drafts. Um, he was going first round and then you kind of see him go end of the first start of the second. And I think last champions, I got him in the third, which kind of fell to me. Um, I was pretty happy about that. I know so, you guys don't necessarily love to draft the QBs early, but um, getting Gabriel in the third round, I thought was great value, but starting to see McLeod jump up above him, it seems like in some of these drafts. So um, 
it'd be interesting to see kind of how how this uh, how this um, goes over the next few months with with where he starts to really end up in these drafts. But right now he's he's kind of that end of first round, start of the second round, or kind of dropping, I guess, out as far as the last draft. I I mean for you you guys, he just he's super consistent. Um, the scary part for me again, it's going into the Big Ten, but any we're st- seeing McLeod come up, right? Anybody else you think you might put over him as we get closer to the season, or you feel pretty good with him kind of in that third spot? Cause it really felt like those first few drafts, it was tier one was Salter Brown and then Gabriel kind of right there on the end. It feels like it's kind of, kind of getting a little more gray area in there. Is that the case for you guys at all? Or are you still pretty solid with him at the, that top tier with the, those other two? Yeah, for me, I mean, I'm I'm solid with them up there with those other two. I think Dylan Gabriel with Will Stein is a great match. I mean, we talked about Evan Stewart and Tez Johnson. He's one of the rare guys, right? That's two wide receivers being drafted in the first two to three rounds um, in the top 10 for our consensus. So I don't and I don't see the Big Ten as a bad thing at all. I mean, they were blowing teams out so bad last year that they weren't even playing in the third. I, I, Froton, you may know this, but it seemed like they were almost never playing in the fourth quarter. And in some games, they weren't even getting in to the third quarter. So the big 10, um, I mean, their schedule is not that daunting to be honest, in my opinion, in the big 10 this year, but even against the tough teams, that just means you're going to get them for a full game versus a half of a game. And I think that can only mean good things for a Will Stein offense led by Dylan Gabriel. Green light for the first half of the entire schedule. First six weeks, there, there's there's no team you would even consider sitting Dylan Gabriel for. Gets in a Big Ten play, all right. Ohio State goes to Austin, fair. You know that that's that's a different level of talent. But usually, you want your big time guys playing those big time games. So I mean, you'd have to see how it's going. But if it's a pair of undefeateds, which it could very well be. How do you sit them there? You know, you're going to sit Dylan Gabriel in that game. Do you want your best players when the chips are down? Um, Then they got Purdue, Illinois, a retooling Michigan team with two returning starters, you know, Um, Maryland, Wisconsin with Washington. I'm not too intimidated here by that schedule, you know, so I'm feeling pretty good about Gabriel there. I, I feel all right with him. Yeah, I really like that too. Yep. But let's talk about the guy that was controversial and uh, was that got picked over Dylan Gabriel in this last last draft and Jordan McLeod. He is our number four uh, QB on this list. And Jordan McLeod was actually, he transferred into Texas State, right? He was at uh, my alma mater, James Madison University, JMU. He's six foot 200. He averaged 29.8 fantasy points per game last year. Had 3,600 yards passing uh and 35 touchdowns and then he ran from 300 yards and eight touchdowns now he did this all in his sixth season of college football so if you're good with math uh unlike me then this is his seventh year of college ball but he has gotten an upgrade in offensive coordinators even though we think very highly of the jmu guys um he's now with gj kenny G.J. Kenny in his two years as a head coach slash play caller, really where he can call his system. He's been unbelievable at the FCS level and incarnate word at Lindsey Scott. I'm going (laughs) to list off Lindsey Scott's stats to you guys from 2022. My man had 4,700 yards passing and 60 touchdowns. And then he ran for an additional 700 yards and 11 touchdowns. He averaged 43.1 fantasy points per game which is just crazy and then gj kenny took tj finley last year who has been awful for his career and then he put up 3400 yards passing and had 24 touchdowns and then he had an additional five yards five touchdowns rushing so gj kenny's a genius future p5 head coach jordan mcleod's an upgrade in this offense right and he gets pretty much his main weapons back um in the receiving game, he's also got Madi back in the backfield and then adds in that backfield as well. You know, we have um, McLeod. We have him projected at 3,200 yards passing, 26 touchdowns, and then we have him at 255 yards rushing and then six touchdowns there for 
fantasy points per game in six point passing leagues. And so my question for you guys, do you guys think that Jordan McLeod, he, does he hit this over under or over under 3,400 yards this year? So does he, does he get above what TJ Finley did last year? Or does he go below it in 2024? What do y'all think? Well, he's my kind of guy where I, I like QBs who can run. Don't get me wrong. There's an element of running to their game, but that, there's a huge volume of passing to fall back on if he takes a couple of sacks and it, it you know, or a, a particular team has a spy on him and he just isn't able to run. He actually, in this system, is racking up 300-yard games. So, you know, he didn't do anything, remember, the first three games of the season. And then in the bowl game, which we don't care about, they played Air Force, which, I mean – that's that's playing way up for Texas State, playing Air Force's defense here. And you know, everybody plays for Air Force in their bowl game because none of them are going to the to the NFL. So, like that's that's a tough assignment. You can almost throw that out. Otherwise, you look at that stretch run he had, nine consecutive games of 20 plus points with some bombs in there. I mean, I, I feel like he's a, a pretty safe investment. Yeah, I I really like McLeod. He's a guy that um, his his projection is probably going to change. Um, I know the news kind of came out right when we were finishing those up, and it was pretty quick. So probably take another run and look at look at where that's landed. Um, I would say right now it's probably low, just with where we have him. Uh, I definitely see him um, really thriving in that offense. I'm excited about that move. Um, a lot of these guys, these group of five guys, yeah when they want to transfer, you're really worried about where they're going to land. And this was, this was one that got me pretty excited. And immediately um, he's, he's one of the only guys I think that pushes to get in that top tier um, for me with those other three guys. And then I think it's a pretty big gap. Um, but McLeod's the guy that I think he fits in with those other three guys. So I'm excited to see what he's going to do this year um, in that offense. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I mean, Again, GJ Kenny, he's such a genius, right? And I'm excited to see like Jordan McLeod throws a beautiful deep ball. So I think there's some, you know, meat left on the bone with CJ Finley. And uh, I think we're gonna really see Kenny's offense take that next step. And uh it's it's exciting for me because I live 45 minutes down the street from Texas State. And so uh it's gonna be fun to go over there and watch some games and uh I'll keep you guys posted. So um, Froton, you want to take us on to our boy Jackson Dart at number five? You know, I want to take us on Jackson Dart at <laughs> five. You know, there are a few things in this world I want to do more than that. Uh, I Jackson hear. Dart, 6'2, 6'3, 220 is what he's listed at. We'll see how that goes, but I think that's pretty good. Maybe 6'2, 215. But, uh, Old Miss, the lane train, we know what we're getting. I mean, as known a commodity as it gets. Uh, 35 points per game average. That was 16th in the country last year. I think that's probably even low for looking at for this season for Ole Miss. I am extremely bullish on them from uh, a team perspective. I had a lot of shares of Dart last year, and thus I'm carrying them over in, in Dynasty Leagues. Their schedule, the new SEC where everything's wide open and they don't have to deal with the Alabama. Uh, no Alabama. This year, right? You've got Furman, Middle Tennessee, Wake Forest, Georgia Southern, a blistering offseason schedule, a uh, non conference, excuse me. I don't know how they're going to manage that. Kentucky, South Carolina, LSU before the bye. Green lights all around. I, I, I don't see anything that's stopping me here from, from starting him. Going with Oklahoma, Arkansas, at Arkansas. And then Georgia at home. All right. Here we are. You know, last week of the regular season for college fantasy football. You know, that's week 12. The weekend at the week after, week 13, first week of the playoffs in a lot. So that's that's that wedge week, you know, uh, 12, 13. Some leagues that have the four, four team playoffs, that's going to be, you know, week uh, 13 this year because it's 14 weeks. There's double buys for every team, or most of them. So these are two huge weeks, and you have to factor this in with Dart. 
Do you have a contingency plan for the first week of the 18 playoffs? The second week of the 18 playoffs and the first week of the 14 playoffs before they get to playing at Florida. So the schedule is backloaded. It's a, it's a breeze all the way up to November. I mean, it's just basically you're, you're going to want to have a, you know, a plan B come playoff time. And it's a similar situation to what you had with Caleb last year, where he had that late buy that, um, that hurt a lot of people, it hurt me in the Super Bowl, uh, excuse me, the, the Boz Cup, as it's known in the NCAF. That being said, Lane Train, 30 passes per game at 71st in the country, 285 passing yards per game, 19th. So even though they're passing volume, 30 passes per game is pedestrian. 285, I mean, as you'd expect with Kiffin, he's cashing it in on those opportunities. They're only losing... Dwayne Wade, I know that's not his name, I'm just joking, Dayton Wade. Uh, but they got Watkins coming back. You got Antoine Wells heading in and Trey Harris on the outside. Let's go. Let's ride. You know, I, I don't see any reason why they can't clear that 280 passing yards per game mark again. 37-13 total team passing yards and uh, 394 passing attempts. Again, 63rd in the country in passing attempts, 19th in passing yardage. Uh, Rushing, you know what they want to do? They want to run the ball. It's still miss. You know, 41 carries per game. That's 12th in the country. But 4.3 yards per carry, 69th. You know, something about Judkins, people, he's still way up there in the Debbie and the C2C stuff. He averaged 4.4 yards per carry last year or something stupid. You know, like he wasn't, he, he wasn't like some dominant force like he was as a freshman. I'm just interested to see how that goes at Ohio State. And I have shares of judgments. From a fantasy perspective, uh, 40 plus points. He did it four times in 13 games. 30 plus points. He did it six times in 13 games. And then 20 plus points. He did eight times in 13 games. I think that's just the case. Look, this is Ben Lane's hand picked boy since back at USC. Followed him there. He really started settling in toward, towards the second half. Uh, I just think he's hitting his stride. Stats, 3364 yardage, 9.4 yards per attempt, smoking. 23 to 6, touchdown interception ratio, 258 yards per game. Rushing, which this is, you know, part of the appeal of Dart. Ran for 1,000 yards in high school, 119 rushes, 391 yards, 30 rushing yards per game, eight touchdowns. Pretty good. Also to be factored in, as we talked about with Byron Brown, no, no fumbles lost. You put four on the ground, but they all came back really good with the ball security. So you're not going to deal with the 16 turnovers you did with Byron Brown. You got six. And I think he probably cuts that down a little bit this year, but he is a gunslinger. Took 26 sacks for 170 yards lost. So that took a ding on his 391 rushing yards. Uh, but it should be noted that he ran for 614 yards in 2022 uh, with 47 yards per game. So it's not like you can't run for 600 yards and put those numbers up. You know, I, I think that you know, that the downside is the 400 you did last year. I think there's upside. There's 600, maybe 700 upside. I think Ole Miss could explode this year. But uh, team efficiency, passing explosiveness, 12th nationally. Again, they're going deep. Uh, yards per drop back, 8.8. That's ninth. Great numbers. 25% of passes went to wide open receivers. That's 76th in the country. Not a lot, all right? You'd like to see a little more. Maybe Antoine Wells can help boost that. That's only going to increase, you know, Dart's value. Um, and then also to be really excited about, his wide open wide receiver completion rate, 92%. That was seventh best in the country, all right? That's, I mean, I don't know what more you want than that. If you're getting a 30% rate, which even 30%, you're dealing with like, you know, 40th, 50th in the country of wide open rate, you know, uh, for wide receivers with that addition of Mansoin Wells with another year. The same core with Watkins and 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 Harris, Caden Priestcorn, of course. Ooh, he takes advantage of mistakes. I love to see it. And against this soft schedule, he could rip teams. Deep passing, 67th out of 146 with a 16% deep ball rate. Look, a lot, of, a lot of what he's doing isn't deep. It's 
the rhythm and frankly a lot of the middle ground 45 percent of his throws were 10 plus yards i mean he's 30 percent of those passes were going to that middle 10 to 19 yard range he eats there you know because that's where you're waiting and you need the plays to develop you can't just sit there and run these quick screens all the time but when he does they're on the money 17 to 4 big time throw to turnover worthy play ratio on deep passes uh, completed 24 of 48, 41, 41% completion rate for 812 yards. Fine. Not great. Not bad. 92nd percentile passing grade to both the middle and deep levels. He's a big game hunter, you know, and it's not just deep. He also does the reads. Uh, 66% completion rate from 10 to 19 to the 12 to 2 ratio. Just dealing in that range. PF of passing grades are decent in the lowest two levels, 72 to 77. And uh, 20%, 27% of the team's completions went for 20-plus yards, six most in the country. They're making big plays. He's putting it on, even though he's not going deep, only 16% of the time. When he's hitting receivers, he's putting them right in the pocket. Pressure. With no pressure, he's, he's dangerous. 92nd percentile offensive grade. 72% completion rate, 22 to 5 ratio, deadly. Even with pressure, 66% offense grade. That's really good, actually. And an 85, every fifth, 85th percentile run grade. He's elusive and he's great thrown on the run. Um, in terms of his pressure to sack rate, 2022, 9.6% pressure to sack rate, 13% career pressure to sack rate. So he's mobile. He throws on the run well. I mean, it's everything you're looking for. Play action. With play action, 68.5% uh, completion rate, 11 yards per attempt, 11 to 2 ratio, 12 to 3 big time throw, a turnable worthy play rate. He's nasty. Even without play, play action, he's still completing 61% of his passes, but it goes down to 7.7 .7 yards per attempt. The thing is, they're doing RPOs all the time. So that's just part of the offense. That being said, even though play action, 12 to 3 touchdown interception rate, 1,500 yards, he's fine. Uh, overall, you know, 10.5, ADOT, 20th out of 95 qualifying QBs, really good. 110.2 NFL passer rating, that's 13th in the country. Um, I like everything about Jackson Dart. I think he is an incredible 18 to 1 value to be the Heisman Trophy winner. I think that. That Jaden Daniels profile is him, except he's even younger. You know, he's a year four quarterback, came back for this year. He's in that mix to be, you know, a highly drafted NFL QB. I think he gets there. Him and Carson Beck are like my two favorite 2025 draft QBs. And this is a Jackson Dart autograph. Bowman University, one of five only graded nine. Uh, big believer. I'm invested in Jackson Dart. I think he's a worthy five. I know it's probably a little bold, but I, this is probably due to me. Where did you guys have him? Go ahead, Zach. Um, I don't. I don't have it in front of me. I think he was my sixth QB, sixth or seventh, I believe. Um, I, I have but, it. It you had okay. my QB five. Five. Yeah. yeah. So one, I, one I, of us I, here that didn't have him there. Yeah, I Makes up yes. for Jackson Arnold. I'll let it it's, go. It's, the, the Jackson. Hey, but I had I had Jackson Arnold at eleven too, so I was fair. Close, fair. No, you're no, right. We're good. I I like Dart. I mean, you said. I mean, everything you said, right? I just think he's in for a big season this year. He's a guy that um, I don't think I have any shares of him yet, um, but definitely a guy that's that's on my radar. So I'm excited to see what he can do this year. All right, real quick, I want to hit a quick break because I want to keep talking about Jackson Dart. Because I want to have a little bit of a Debbie conversation about this guy. But let's hit a break. We'll come back, talk about Jackson Dart, a few sleeper QBs, and then we're going to get out of here. All right. So I feel like part of what you just did, uh, Froton, was you just did a great Debbie breakdown of this dude, Jackson Dart. I mean, I think Can't he's absolutely. I got I to give I it think, all to you. But here's the deal. Like, I think he's absolutely top two QB next year, right? Like, I think, I think you're right there with Carson Beck. I think, I mean, there's some other guys you could have in there, but Jackson Dart, I mean, coming from the SEC, he's in a system that produces quarterbacks. 
I really think that this dude, look, we just put this up. Dynasty coach a, that's one of my boys. And he, <laughs> he was, he's super high on Jackson. Dart. He picked oh, him in chat's hot. round one chat's in the hot on Jackson dart. And I, I'm, yeah. I'm, with, I'm with the chat. We are, but in. he's, he was in January. He was super high on him. And like, I see it. Right. And if Antoine Wells can stay healthy, with those other wide receivers they have coming back, I mean, this offense is going to be so explosive. If they don't go in the portal and get a running back, then what does Ulysses Bentley do best? He catches passes out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. Henry Parrish, the same thing. I mean, <laughs> everything is setting up for this guy to just go good. ham this year. So, anyways, I, I love this. I love your take on this. I think I, I absolutely think that he could end up as a QB one or two in CFF this year too. It's particularly in six point passing touchdown leagues. And so I think all of this is, is really, really good. We got to um, toss up Alexander Thompson's comment here. If we can producer, man, our, our number one producer Froton 1000% sleeps with that dark card. Oh, I'm, Oh, he's so right. Oh, Alexander. How did you know, you know, I love my dark red know it sorry sorry i got excited there You're right <laughs> no that but here's the deal like I, yeah i love what you said about jackson dart i love where this conversation is going but i want to have a little bit of a different conversation i think we're going to shell the next five qbs for the next show because i think this content is good and i want to continue to have these conversations mm -hmm. but people have been asking in the comments a lot about sleeper qbs Right. And oh, who are the, nice. who are the guys that we would have coming in? One, uh, we did a great show on sleeper QBs that you can get in like the 20th plus round. But there's been some guys that have been mentioned in the chat. And so I want to pull some of these guys up on the screen. I want you guys to talk about them a little bit. I know this is off the cuff. And so I can I can, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how this goes. But Preston Stone. He's a guy oh, yeah. that, you know. He's been cleared. He came back at the end of spring ball and he's going to be the QB one. SMU is going to ACC. ACC doesn't play defense any better than AAC. So I think he's got a lot of opportunity here, you know, and he's got some really good wide receivers there. What are you guys, particularly again, we're doing six point passing touchdown leagues, right? And so Preston Stone would have a bump in that. What are, what is y'all's take on Preston Stone? Where would you guys take him with six point passing touchdowns? Uh, so Josh, do you have where I had him ranked? I like Preston Stone in six point. Yeah, let me pull this up real it, quick. Love him. I mean, he's a guy that, um, I mean, last year we, we got a little bit in the run game too. There wasn't a lot, but um, we did get a little bit of value there. But he, yeah, we got a I little mean, bit. Yeah. Yeah. And he had, I mean, one, two, three, four, four games five games of three plus touchdowns. Right. So that's something I'm always yeah. looking at. Right. How's, how's he doing there? Um, they're going to throw the ball. Josh, you nailed it. They have some receivers there. I really like that. I don't know what the run game's going to look like really either. Um, seem like they, they went with committee last year a little bit. They had s some injuries, but I, I just think he's the strength of that offense. And, um, transitioning to um you know the new conference maybe they're playing from behind a little bit is what i'm hoping for so you're gonna see him throw the ball a little bit more too i like stone though this year um he's a guy i've tried to get i like where his value is right now um in some of these drafts he he's um yeah he's pretty it's it's pretty good so uh he's a guy that i'm trying to get he's usually in my queue i feel like i haven't got him as much lately but early on i was i liked where i was able to get him Sure. With Stone, it's all about if Rhett Lashley is going to go back to throwing the ball again because yeah. he didn't eclipse 30 passes in any of his last five games. That being said, he had at least – he had three touchdowns in eight of his 11 games played. And like Zach mentioned, he was, he was injured. He was hurt for a pretty good part of the season here, you know. So um, – you know, he, when he wasn't specifically injured, he was still a little hampered. So the fact that he's still out there racking up, you know, in seven of his last eight games, he had at least three touchdowns. And the one that he didn't, he had two. You know, the, the only and, and that was the only one that breaks a streak is just TCU. He had a bad game against a power five opponent where he went he threw two interceptions. But fine. And 
In he only plays true. them once, you know? Like, how many times he played TCU? Moving on, Preston Stone is absolutely, in my opinion, especially especially in the six-point pass and touchdown leagues, he is a viable lockdown number two. He's going in our leagues, in the Champions League, in the 12th round, 11th, 12th round, frankly. And, you know, he's going outside of that QB2 range. I would say he's probably going in, like, around QB30, you know, QB25 to 30. He should be a top 20 pick. Top 20 yeah, and – yeah, Zach and I both have him at QB 16. Listen to this schedule over the last six games of the year. He's got Stanford, Duke, S, uh, Pittsburgh, Boston College, UVA, and California. And those are all teams. I mean, I think the upgrade in t- – like what happened in the AAC is they were so much better than every other team that they just ran the ball, right? They're not going to be able to do that right away in the ACC. And so they're going to have to throw the ball more. I, I think there's an uptick in his production – based on them going up and playing more difficult teams than they did in the AAC. And all those teams are pretty decent offensively as well. They should be able to put up some stats. And so they could get into some shootouts as they transition. What do you think, Zach? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I like Stone. He, so just to piggyback on what Froton was talking about in those last seven games, I mean, he was a top 25 QB in five of the seven games. Right. And, They weren't throwing the ball. Like you said, they weren't throwing the ball nearly as much. And he was still, I mean, he's still a, a, in that tier of what you want in your lineup. If you're, if you're playing a season long. So um, yeah, stone's a guy that, that I like. And like I mentioned, I I love where his value is right now. And just to to tie a bow on, on the stone point. Yeah. Do, are they going to be scoring the same volume they were last year? Absolutely not. That that's not happening. Are they going to be throwing with a greater volume than they were last year? Absolutely. And that's kind of the point I was making with last year, last year, where it's like, dude, congratulations. You're 20, 28, 20, 23, and 19. That's the amount of passes he threw each of the last five games. Like, that ain't happening. It's going to be the 35, 40 pass per game range. And in that's the right. six-point passing yeah. touchdown leagues, he's going to feast. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Okay, I want to move to let's see other ones. Any we'll other, we uh, about, QB. Yeah, we talked about Kyron drones already a little bit, but we want to talk about you know so Nino said he'll sneak onto this list by midseason. We didn't have him on there basically because this is a six point passing touchdown. He would have been on there otherwise. Yeah, I think for most of us, I, it, it brings him down. That's the only thing with drones. Well, let's do it. All right, let's let's talk about drones. I mean, it the, it's everything. It's that volume. I mean, when he goes off, too, he 20 carries, 135, 20 carries, 176. You know, he's, he's getting huge volume. But then, you know, you look at how it went down the end of the year. He had one rushing touchdown in his last eight games. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight. And he only had, in his first three games, he didn't have any rushing touchdowns. He only had he had two rushing touchdowns against Marshall. Congratulations. Two against Pitt, and then one in the bowl game against Tulane. So, bottom line, he had two rushing touchdowns all season against power five opponents. Congratulations, Kyron Drones, like this amazing running quarterback. And then you're looking at the passing volume. All right. Well, here's his again, we'll go with the last few games. 21 passes, 22. 30 against NC State for a whopping 225 yards. Oh, my gosh. Uh, in fact, yeah, 21 passes, 91 yards. 22 passes, 244. 30, 225. 17, 219. 21, 69. 24, 194. It's like he had one 300-yard game. He had one game over 245 yards all season passing. Like you're going to tell me that Kyron Drones is the special running quarterback, right? But he scored one touchdown in the last eight games. And we know that Brent Pry wants to protect his defense. And you got Byshaw Tootin there. Put it all together. You get it. That's how I feel about Kyron Drones being a top 10 QB. Not in my world. Not on my watch. Yeah. Chris, I- and Chris K, the defender of Kyron Drones. I love Nino. Nino's my boy. We took a picture at the Senior Bowl together, me, uh, Dirienzo, and Nino. And he's my boy. He helps me. I mean, N- Nino's bossing through and through in my home. But Nino, we ain't going to be a top 10. Me, Nino. 
<laughs> Zach, what you, yeah. what you got on? Kyler yeah, Murray? I was just going to say, you know, th- there has to be more rushing production from him if there's going to be any value. He didn't even um, – obviously, scoring can change this, but from what I have pulled up right now, not even one week in the top 10 last year. So uh, he was close in that pit game where he had five total touchdowns, um, but that was it. He came in 11th there, um, and it just – there just wasn't – you if he's not going to have better rushing production scoring wise then i just i i don't see him even sniffing the top 10 um in a league like this right a six point passing um even in a four point i mean i just there he's got to do he, he's got to get more out of that rushing game or something's got to change in the pass game um cuz it's just not i mean 15 total touchdowns passing is not it's just, no, nope. it's not there. Um, four point passing to touchdown it. only. I don't even want on my team yeah. unless it's four point passing passing touchdowns. Right. Yeah. Like, what yeah. am I gonna? I'm gonna go and waste what a top five round, top ten round pick. Like screw that. I I what? have. I've been getting Jackson Dart in our Champions Leagues. I've gotten Jackson Dart. I think at least in two of them in that seventh round pocket, and I will yeah. keep taking yeah. him in the seventh round every single time he's there. As opposed to dealing yeah. with Kyron Drones in the sixth. He's going ahead of Jackson Dart in the second one, in the third one. He, he went ahead of Jackson Dart. So it's your fault, Chris K and, and Greg Brown. Yeah. You, you well, look in the mirror. Enjoy. Pro time. Jackson Dart's probably the best value right now in CFF leagues. And he's phenomenal. Best value on Bowman you. Best value in CFF here. Oh, I'll, I'll forget. You don't think? Yeah, I just have a red. Oh, I got a gold too. There's a gold Jackson Dart. So yeah, Jackson Dart's just all around betting him for the uh, Heisman. I, everything, 100 Jackson Dart. I'm on the train. I'm riding it. I'm thrilled. 100. Apparently, and Carson Beck too. I'm in on Carson Beck. Obviously. Well, apparently, Froton uh, Baylor Bear says Froton is also a drone stand. Clearly. Oh, oh. So, Bay- Zach, you got any final, <laughs> you got any final thoughts on drones? No, I I haven't taken him once yet, and where he's going right now, I don't think I ever will. All right, well we're gonna we're gonna wrap I'm it up saying. with with Bad this value. quote here. I got hit yeah. on by Chris K on Twitter. You know, <laughs> Chris, Mrs. K, you gotta talk to him. Talk to him about his Chris Tyron drone stand. Hey, they got a, they got a long long drive tomorrow. They got ten, to hours, talk about ten hours to talk to him about Tyron drones, Mrs. K. Poor they, Mrs. K. You're going to have to hear about why like, Kyron Jones is a top 10, top 10 QB. All right. <laughs> hey, we're going to end with this. Benjamin Jacobs said, is Nico mainly just projection here at this spot? I feel like green could be higher. Hey, Benjamin, you're going to have to come back next week to hear us talk about Nico, well, like green, green, and our other top 10 QBs. So, it's fair, hey. It's a fair take, Benjamin. It's a very fair it, take. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very fair take. I'm excited to talk about the rest of our list. I think the rest of our list is on, honestly, it's going to be more fun to talk about than the top five. Because the top five, the top five, like I think they are who they are. But this next six through 10, there's these guys are going all over the map according to ADP. So it's going to be a fun conversation. I think next week we can uh, hopefully have some transfer portal news to talk about. And then we can we can end with our with our six through 10 QBs. But I think it's going to be a fun show. We got, we got Baylor Bear. I got to let Baylor Bear go. Ba- Baylor Bear wants a top 10 Kyron Drones bet. So, I mean, if that's what we got to do, if that's what, if that's the world we're living in, then I do, oh, I do, t-shirts. Wow. I do t-shirts or I do like high end roast beef sandwiches. There aren't many of those in, uh, in San Diego. So we can't do those. No pizzas. Can't do pizzas. Uh, maybe a t-shirt. Maybe a play college fantasy football shirt for my boy Baylor Bear. Huh? Huh? Are we, are we, I, I think we're going to have to do that. We might, we might have a little something coming out in the near future. Oh, coming out. So, Baylor uh, you Bear, know, you're on, my friend. You're on. If, he, if he's a top 10, mark it down. All right. Baylor Bear is getting sent out a play college fantasy football shirt. That's fair. Hey, speaking of the future. Uh, I talked to somebody in Austin this last week, uh, a, a one Mike Bainbridge, who's been oh, missing from this wow. show. In in Austin, mind you. You know what he told me? You know what he told me in Austin? Oh, my gosh. What did he 
He said, I think I'm going to be on the next show that you guys do. Whoa. That's good because dude, I can't be, I can't be on next week. It's the draft week and I can't, I, I have, this is like the last one I'll skip for a while. So, well, Bainbridge there we has go. to come well, on now. He has to come no on. No Froton, Mike Bainbridge, top five. Man, this show might be 20 minutes long next week. Oh, I, I'm pissed because I have, <laughs> I have my, uh, who is my last guy? I have him queued up and I'm ready to go on him too. It's too bad. I'm yeah. I'm not going to be able to give well, it to you. I'll have to come back and, and give it. Um, it's, yes. Uh, who did you give me? Haynes King. Oh, man. Are you down with the king? You down with the king? You know, you know who that is? You know that? Yes. You know, you know down with the king? But I guess, but I'm only I'm only down with DRX. It's from so. DMC. It's from DMC. <laughs> there we go. So Love Haynes it. King. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to get in. I wanted to get into Haynes King. I'm sorry, guys. All right. I'll have to when I come back in two weeks, we'll have a quick Haynes King uh, a flossing. And uh, yeah. and, there we and go. we'll get we'll get into whatever the topic uh du jour is, which will probably be spring games. Also, I will be at the USC spring game. Josh, you going to any of these this weekend? This weekend, I'm doing a wedding in Lubbock. So unless Texas Tech somehow playing like 11 a.m., then I will not be hitting up a spring game this weekend. But I'll be watching. Well, there's nothing. So I have nothing, lots of thoughts. I don't think anything holy has ever happened in Inglewood. So I know you <laughs> won't be. The wedding won't be there. But uh, I will be at the Coliseum. So be on the lookout. Very excited. And uh, and I will report back on how I feel about the USC wide receiver room here. Huh? Were you excited? I'm excited. Dude, I'm, I'm super interested in that, actually. I think there's some sleepers that could come out of that room. I'm really fired. We'll especially save that given, for when we... Yeah, especially given like the, the draft stuff. Deuce Robinson's going undrafted in the 30-team, actually be 30-round leagues. I, I've been really close to pulling the trigger on Deuce. I got Zach in the ninth this past league, Zachariah Branch. I want to say, did you take uh, Ja'Cory Lane? Somebody took or Ja'Cory uh, Lane, I want to say, like went to 20th, maybe 20, 21st. Yeah. yeah Makai so, Lemon's intriguing, too. I mean, they got some Yeah, and he didn't even like. get drafted. I want to say Deuce and Makai didn't get drafted that last one. So that's, that's yeah. an interesting situation. There. So, all right. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Hey, we. I think we're done, but we're so thankful that you guys are supporting the show. Man, the comments have been awesome. It's fun to be able to interact with them this week. Um, that makes, I think, the show really special for us. If you guys can continue to support us by liking, commenting, subscribing at Fantasy Points, we're going to be here every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern. At least two or three of us will. Talking college ball. So come back next week. Hear about our next iteration of our top six through ten QBs. Until then. Do small things with great love.